control. And this is a supplement to the interview done by Penn Wood in 1972. Today's date is October 23, 1991. And the interview has been conducted by Roger Harris for the Oklahoma Historical Society. <clears throat> and the location of the interview is in Mrs. Chateau's home in Oklahoma City. Well, I suppose I would want to uh, uh, to start by by uh, recollecting for you that on that original interview that you did, um, it was uh, really quite informative, I thought. But our our reason for having a rekindled interest is largely the recognition that you and other ballerinas from Oklahoma have been getting as a result of the the mural that's that's to be uh, unveiled in just a few weeks at the Capitol. So how did you first come into contact with information about the mural? Were you a part of the process? Or? Oh no, oh no. But Betty Price did inform me. She called me and told me Betty I think is a wonderful woman. I don't know how she does all that she did, but I was fortunate to know her in Muskogee. Uh, she called and said, well, Yvonne, we are finally going to go through with this project. Now, there has been a little, I believe, an 8 by 10 photograph of Maria, Rosella, Mosselin Larkin, and myself hanging there. And at some point, uh, it seems that it has been talked about for many years now, perhaps 10, 12 years, that they wanted to do an extended or a larger portrait or even a mural or a painting. I certainly didn't expect anything of this magnitude, frankly. But she said, we have finally uh, began work on it. So I said, well, that, I said, that's wonderful. I'm very, very thrilled. And she proceeded to tell me about there were several different artists that had submitted their sketches and drawings of their interpretation. And uh, I looked over them all. And they were all, of course, very interesting, each artist different in style. And I had nothing to do with the choosing, no. But mm -hmm. I was, frankly, uh, very pleased when they chose Mike Larson. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is interesting, I think, that uh, to consider that um, the, the art that we see at the state capitol depicting uh, prominent Oklahomans, largely men, uh, um, I, I can't recall any women yet <laughs> until this is unveiled. Uh, perhaps I'm missing someone obvious. But um, in any case, uh, outside of political figures um, and a few others, uh, Native Americans, um, uh, leaders, I should say, Native American leaders, and then lastly, uh, Will Rogers and Jim Thorpe, so this puts a, a new uh, category, which I think um, says something different about the state. Is that is that the message that you get? Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I think it's wonderful that the recognition of the arts, the artistic side. Mm -hmm. Of course, Oklahoma has <laughs> many, many native sons and daughters who have brought glory to this beloved state. I mean, mm -hmm. Lucille Mulhall and Pearl Mesta <laughs> right. down the line, so on. Mm -hmm. But this is an artistic dimension, yes. I found it to be quite interesting in that respect, and I, I was curious to, about how others responded. Well, um, in terms of how that particular mural uh, of the five ballerinas is presented, the, um, the concept, as, as Mike Larson has discussed with me and, and with you, I assume, is to uh, represent it as a collective effort of all five and not specifically of one. And I assume that that was agreeable. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not sure how you could respond otherwise. But <laughs> we, were, we were not, um, of course, we were all, were more or less in the same uh, era, mm -hmm. having been born in either the late 20s or, or 30s, or <clears throat> I think there was a, um, a decade difference. Miss Hightower is the senior ballerina. Uh, 
at the time that we were all studying ballet, of course we started out here, and of course we had to go either to the West Coast or the East Coast as our training progressed and became more advanced. And of course we were aware of one another, but our paths never, never actually crossed until much later. And at that time, of course, Maria and I were in Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo together. And then at a later date, Miss Larkin and I were in Ballet Russe together. And then on the other hand, Miss Marjorie Tallchief, Maria's sister, and Rosella were in American Ballet Theater together and ended up at Paris Opera together. And then, of course, Maria was in head of New York City Ballet. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the, the paths were <laughs> intertwining. Mm -hmm. But this will be nice because the finals will, will be together. But at the time, we were just busy working, establishing our careers. And of course, I had known. Uh, I didn't meet the tall chiefs. <clears throat> they had left Fairfax when they were, I believe, around 10. The mother wanted to take them to California, Los Angeles, to advance their musical training, piano and ballet. So when I went there to study, when I was 10 or 11, I met Marjorie and Maria there in California for the first time. And I had I'd known Rosella from here, and of course I had known Miss Lark. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was interesting that many, many years later. Well, well, the subject matter of all of this project, I think, brings uh, something else to mind, too, and that is that um, was there or, or is there a consciousness, on your part at least, of, of having a Native American heritage and, and did that contribute in some way to your art? I believe that question has been asked more <laughs> times. Has it? Indeed. <laughs> all over seems I've done, whenever an interview arose, and I'm sure the other girls will tell you the same thing, they would ask, why is it that there are five girls from Oklahoma of Native American descent? Why? How did it happen? <laughs> and I really don't know. Of course, one thing that I always said, and I feel strongly, having gone to the powwow since I was born, and I'm sure that tall chiefs, high heart Mark and everyone can say the same. We all grew up around powwows and watching the Indians dance. Dancing for an Indian is totally natural. Mm -hmm. It's not an act, a performance, the way the, the ballet is. It's not, you know, it's natural, as mm -hmm. you know yourself. It's a way of thanksgiving, of, of celebrating, or mourning a death, whatever. It's just natural for an Indian to dance. And uh, I have noticed over the years many critiques when they were talking about one of us would say they possess such a lightness of foot and that makes sense there's your Native American heritage coming mm -hmm. out and the sense of rhythm the Native mm -hmm. American rhythm so I would say of course that having the Indian ancestors played an important part in our being able to dance and loving it so much well, you know, I think there's a positive stereotype of Native Americans that they tend to be more spiritual in their, uh, on the average, perhaps not all, but uh, uh, is that a fair uh, Absolutely. description, Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just the whole, their whole way of life. Yeah. You know, it belongs to today, environment, concern for the environment, wildlife, animals. Now, when you were, when you were it is your youngest memory. I, I think, if I recall, you you began dancing around three years of age. Two and a half. Two and a half. My goodness, I can hardly think of, of being able to recall anything at two and a half. Now, do, were your parents especially interested, or did it sort of evolve uh, accidentally? My father said in his famous words when I was born that his his only, my mother's and his only daughter, I'm an only child, mm -hmm. would be either an opera singer or a ballerina. Really? And that, I think, that perhaps would stem from the fact that my grandfather, my father's father, Edmund Chouteau, was a musician. He was blind, but he was an exquisite violinist really? and pianist, very much interested in classical music, and he taught all of his life in Veneta, violin mm -hmm. and piano. So obviously that love of music came down from daddy to me, and of course mother was very interested in the arts. She was a teacher, and she met my daddy at a reservation 
Fort Defiance. That's how they met. Oh, I see. Was very, very intrigued with the American Indian. Mm -hmm. And of course, they fell in love immediately. And uh, so I was born of that union. And uh, my dad just always said, and he was, uh, I might say quite truthfully, he was there. They were both there behind me. They were not pushing in the sense of pushing me in, in, you know, into doing parts. But I think it's so interesting that you ask that question, Roger, because that's what impressed me so deeply about Mike's interpretation. That what it represents to me is, is no, it's not just five ballerinas in a white dress, but the total thing. First of all, it starts with the heritage, yes. the, the mystical, spiritual part, the, e, the five geese, and the ancestors, and the trail of tears. It starts with our heritage, our ancestors, what we got from our ancestors, or what any Native American artist would get. Then it shows them, the, art, the girls, we represent that time of dancing. And then it comes down to show the little ones that will become. Mm -hmm. And it just says it all. It says everything that I feel personally so deeply. The past, I respect, and the present, and the future to come, the little ones to come. Of course, teaching, you know, all of us have taught. And my great love is teaching children. Yeah. I enjoy teaching the young ones the most. Now, was Oklahoma a fertile ground for dance in, in your childhood? Uh, well, there was always a great love for it here. It's my uh, reading over some of Dad's things from the past 50 years. Uh, there was always some sort of artistic activity here, I mean, coming through town, performing, you know, the great artists, and uh, you could, uh, there were some fine teachers here, but as they themselves admitted, when you got to a certain level, they themselves, my teacher was Miss Asher, would send me to the East Coast or the West Coast, where the finest teachers were just at that time beginning to come mm -hmm. over from Europe, from mm -hmm. Russia. And Mr. Balanchine, the famous choreographer, at that time was bringing all of the famous Russian teachers to teach at his School of American Ballet, where I eventually went and won a scholarship, mm -hmm. and where all of us have studied at one point or another. School of American Ballet, and Mr. Obukov, Mr. Vladimirov, all of them. Of course, there you would advance and, and uh, would go as far as you could in your studies until you auditioned to become a company member. Now, you went to New York at what age? I went in 1941. I was 12. Uh -huh. And at Oklahoma City and uh, studied. And before coming home, just by chance, I went to the auditions at the School of American Ballet, which was is national. You could come from all over the world to audition for this prestigious school. And just, just for the fun of it, I decided I would go audition. And lo and behold, I won for my, my junior division, and they offered me a life scholarship. So mother and dad thought that we could not possibly turn this, this offer down. So uh, dad said, well, of course, he would have to come back to Oklahoma, where his job was. And that he did, and mother and I stayed there in an apartment with a little Irish lady, and I studied. It was, day, it was study, three lessons a day. In order to go to academic school, I had to go to a school called Professional Children's School, which means you could go four hours a day if you were not touring on the road or performing. Otherwise, you could go two hours a day and then do the rest by correspondence. And what neighborhood did you live in? At what? What neighborhood did you live in in New York? Uh, Where did I live? Yes. On 58th Street, 125 West 58th, right across, right in back of Carnegie Hall. Right. <laughs> Carnegie Hall and then, um, what's the other hall? Steinway. Steinway. Right. Mm -hmm. So that must have had some influence on you too, don't you think? It was a terrible shock to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I was only 12, and uh, you know, when I won uh -huh. the scholarship, and it was such a different way of life. It was very, also it was different from my mom. Uh, life is much quieter here. <laughs> to suddenly go there and be surrounded by hundreds of girls my own age, who this dancing thing was the most important thing in the world. You know, it was life or death. <laughs> and they would kill. It was just the competition was just 
kind of overwhelming to me. And I thought at the time, well, I'm, I'm really going to have to work awfully hard in order, you know, to be on the same level or hopefully to rise above <laughs> to improve. And so that I mean, just kind of put the blinders on and get to those lessons and work. I was very fortunate. I loved each one of my teachers very much and they took a great interest in me. I was very fortunate. Now, I know you were aware of your of your of your native heritage. Uh, did you start to become more aware of your French heritage uh, when you arrived in New York? Or uh, yes, that's a very good question, Roger. In fact, one of the first, uh, uh, Mr. Jeanneau Cherone, who's a very famous in, uh, mm -hmm. figure in the ballet world, he says, "Why do you call yourself Shoto?" I said, "Well, that's the way we say it in Oklahoma. That's the way the Indians say it." He said, but it is a beautiful French name. It should be Chouteau. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was always aware of my French heritage because Dad was very proud uh -huh. of, of the French, his French ancestry. Because of course, I have a little more than an eighth Shawnee on the Cherokee, and the rest, of course, my, uh, the other ancestors were French. Uh -huh. I was aware of it. That, uh, but not on your mother's side, is that correct? My mother was French and French English, is no I, Indian. I see. I see. Now, what your father... Did he have sort of an especially keen interest in his heritage? Uh, oh, yes. Just to put it mildly, Daddy, huh? Daddy was very, very interested. Yeah. And it, uh, he was very, very interested in Jean-Pierre Chouteau and the first white settlement in Oklahoma. He pursued it relentlessly up to the last day of his life. Uh -huh. Did you get the impression he was pretty, pretty uh, confident that he had solve most of the puzzles and so forth? Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know. I think he did a great deal. I've, I've noticed and now I'm looking back, reading over his papers, he did an enormous amount of letter writing to people and he received an enormous amount of information. I'm finding out all sorts of interesting things. Um, uh, that there were Osage Chouteaus, the Chouteau clan married and, and, and had uh, Osage wives, Rosalie, and I, frankly, right now, at this time, I am becoming interested. I, had, I didn't have time mm -hmm. before. I was too busy working, establishing my career, and then after coming home, teaching, and but now I'm become, becoming very interested in, in the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The St. Louis end of it, the Kansas City, and so forth. Now, did you feel that you had... Um when you were when you were before you went to New York, did you feel that you had a, a mentor here in Oklahoma for dance, or did you? Well, mother and dad, we were of course very close family, and my teacher, Frony Asher, was wonderful. Yes, I had many, 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 many helpful people, but of course none to the extent of my mother and father. Like each one of us, you can't do it alone. You really cannot do it alone in any phase of artistic uh, ballet or music or show business, however you want to call it. You've got to have some kind of a mentor. For Rosella, it was her teacher. Rosella lived in Kansas City after she uh, left Oklahoma and studied there. Her teacher, Dorothy Perkins, a very famous teacher of ballet, whom I, that's when I met Rosie when I went up there to study with Miss Perkins, Dorothy Perkins, one of the really first great American teachers. She's the one that stood behind Rosella all the way. Maria and Marjorie, their mother, and Miss Larkin, her mother. Mm -hmm. So each one of us had someone there, you know, so, oh, can't do it, can't do it anymore, it's too hard, I just cannot face all of this alone. And that person was always there behind us. Mm -hmm. Is that a common experience for the uh, the ballerina as they progress in their... There has to be someone there for you. Mm -hmm. A teacher or a mother or a father or whatever. Right. Now as you, as you traveled about uh, more than just uh, in America, obviously, uh, Europe and so on, did you get a lot of silly questions about your native heritage? And no. Were they pretty genuinely curious, you think? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course, what I, what I resented so much, and of course my, my father did too, and I guess any true opponent, 
the uh, usual comment was, Oklahoma? Oh, cowboys and Indians. Mm -hmm. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, every one of us have stood up to that. So what kind of is wrong with that? It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely wonderful. The, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if indeed there is an influence uh, uh, that we, we went through a period, I believe, in Oklahoma where we had less of an opportunity for the Native American artist, less of an opportunity perhaps for all artists across the country because of economics of the mid-century and so forth. And, and then that turned around, I, I, in my opinion at least. But I'm, I'm wondering if that contributed in some way to um, uh, the interest and the success of, of the five ballerinas. Do you suppose it may have? This, uh, this sort of vacuum for opportunity and suddenly they were all there at the right time? Well, of course, that's one of the facets of showbiz, that you happen to be at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. A great deal of it has to do with luck. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course we have uh, we have other many fine dancers from Oklahoma that didn't have necessarily Native American heritage, mm -hmm. but that might have contributed. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, I know we can overdo the idea that somehow that there's this there, and I I wouldn't downplay it either, but I, that there's somehow a special. Uh, consciousness that every Native American or every person who has Native American heritage has. I, I don't know whether that's uh, actual or not, but it... Uh, well, I think, you know, that sensitivity plays mm -hmm. an important part, super sensitivity. Yeah. But I have noticed, and I do think there is merit to, to the possibility, that as you uh, get more mature, and I'm not sure at what age that uh, happens, that you start to uh, have an interest in your heritage, whether that be French or Native American or whatever else. Uh, is that was that your experience that you grew, grew I in think a? Uh, is in talking with uh, not only my Native American sisters but uh, the other art and my other colleagues I work with. Uh, there seems to be, as you age, a tremendous desire to sort of fulfill the circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to get back to your roots, to get to really know. I know I've done a lot of thinking. Since I've been back, and well, since I most since I've been retired, since I've had time to think, and uh, oh, there there are times when I I miss uh, I think of my grandmother, grandmother Shoto from Benita. I was able to know her until I was five years of age, at which time she died. But we were very very close. In fact, I'm named after her. My first name is Myra, Myra Ivan. That was my grandmother's name. And in reading over letters and things, I, I just wish you know, that I still had her. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think it's that way. And Maria's father was full blood. Alex Talchi, Mosselin's mm -hmm. father was full blood. And Marcella's uh, mother. But they, there all seems to be the need to get back to the roots and know more about it. Mm -hmm. You said retired, and you meant retired from performing. I'm retired from performing. The la my last performance that I did was at Kennedy Center on Oklahoma Day. I mm -hmm. went up with the group from here, and that was uh, 76, mm -hmm. in 1976. I did my Trail of Tears variation there. But you continue to teach? I, I taught at OU. I've been retired from OU since uh, 87. And last August, I retired my little, my private ballet school that was just up the street for mm -hmm. children, young people. And that I'm missing enormously. I'm missing the children. I didn't realize the huge emotional uh, mm -hmm. thing that existed between you and your students, especially, you know, when I trained them from the age of 5 to 16. They become almost like your own. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing that. I teach occasionally now. It's it hard to it's sort of hard to separate from that, isn't it? Yes, very, mm -hmm. very. Mm -hmm. Uh, give us a, some idea. I I have a, a very limited knowledge of the production of Four Moons, and could you tell us a little about how that began and and what you recall about that? 
that began, of course, the, the very first what we, uh, Miss Larkin, called the Indian Ballerina Festival. In fact, if you want, I was talking with her the other day, and she said, I said, well now, Lucia, aren't you the one that originated all this business of the five Indian Ballerina? She said, no, how it was actually born was our good friend, whom I knew, Anatole Chujoy, he was a Russian, a very famous uh, impresario of ballet, whom she had met in New York. He came to us one day and said, like in 50, 55, something like that, says, do you realize that you have five girls from Oklahoma? Why don't you do something about this? You know, make a production. So the, the first, uh, the first time that we were supposed to be together was in '57 in Tulsa. We were supposed to dance anything we wanted. The five of us, all of us could come except Marjorie. We could not leave Paris at that time. She had performances. So it was just the four of us. Ten years later, '67, the idea of the four moons was being formed, and that was to be a uh, Oklahoma collaboration of artists. Lewis Ballard, the composer, Jerome Tiger, the artistic rendition, and then we would be dancing with our Oklahoma City Symphony or the Tulsa Symphony. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the two cities would meet at uh, Stroud, <laughs> the committees, and plan this big production, and Dewey and Ann Bartlett were very much behind it, and uh, oh, many other well-known names here, H Hightower and so on. Um, not the Indian Hightower, Danny yes. Hightower. Mm -hmm. And so out of that grew the four moons. And of course we didn't realize at the time, and it is with really great sadness, that we were so busy putting it together, no one ever filmed or did any video of that performance. Mm -hmm. So we have no record. Now Ballard actually wrote uh, and Ballard wrote the score, and he uh -huh. would send, he'd send my tape to me for my variation, and my husband, Miguel, did the choreography mm -hmm. for the first part, and Mr. Jasinski, Mosslin's husband, did the choreography for the last part. So it was a perfect collaboration. Ms. Hightower did her variation, and Ms. Tallcheap's husband, Mr. Skibine, did hers. Now at that one, there were only four of us also, because at that time, Maria was retired. So you see, it, uh, we never quite all five got together until now. Can that be in some way reproduced perhaps at some time? Uh, I wish, I wish. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a very, very sad fact. It has been said now, and I don't know how much, I don't know how much truth there is in this. It has been said that there is some footage somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Of course, Jean, Jean Dillahay is gone now. Yes. And we can't ask him. I was very close to Gene and his wife. But someone either here or there had some kind of footage on it, but we don't know where, or it's being secluded somewhere. Mm -hmm. But nothing, no, nothing was done that's available. But uh, at least enough of the material <laughs> and the music it still exists too. Well, the, the, the music, Miss uh, the Tulsa Valley Theater, Miss Larkin, mm -hmm. uh, and her husband recreated it for the younger generation, not mm -hmm. too many years ago. Mm -hmm. Now that was Jerome Tiger's uh, last sort of hurrah before his death was there. There it is. Oh, oh I see. Blue, the blue. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly his. You want me to bring it over? No, no, I can uh, deal with that, I think. of the souvenir books, mm -hmm. beautiful souvenir books that uh, in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And of course, anyone who bought the book could take the cover page and have it framed. Mm -hmm. and that would be quite a collector's item today. It's, of course, anything that Jerome Tiger is. Yeah. Now, were you acquainted with him prior to the production? I had production? never met him, no. Uh -huh. and the sad part is, of course, that uh, we all know the sad details of his, mm -hmm. his death, mm -hmm. and that that happened mm -hmm. before the ballet was presented. Uh, uh, did that cause some problems in presenting the ballet? It, it, no. No. Not at all. Mm -hmm. it, 
just seems so terribly tragic with such a rising <laughs> young artist. Well, now, is, do you suppose that once that we get this identity established in the minds of, of, um, of Oklahomans through the, through the mural that's going into the capital, that um, we'll start to see a new interest in ballet, or, or perhaps a little stronger, broader interest? I think ballet has, has, def has reached a peak of interest that we know, let's, let's say, eight years ago or something, there was an enormous interest in ballet, so to speak. At the moment, there seems to be a slight pulling away, trying to develop, of course, what that is all due to is that the famous teachers that I work with are the famous choreographers like George Balanchine, mm -hmm. Anthony Tudor, uh, all of the, uh, Leonid Miasin, all of the great, great choreographers of that era, whom we, all of us girls, were able to work with and under, have died in the last 10 years. And there has been no one really to replace them yet. So this is just kind of a, a very strange, tricky period right now. Mm -hmm. The art trying to find itself in a new identity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, there are always those who will love the classical ballet as it was. I hadn't thought of that. I guess it is kind of seeking its own identity here, isn't it? Yeah. Perhaps that's the cycle we go through every now and then. Well, um, also wanted to include uh, on this tape that uh, you are at least scheduled to. We don't know whether it will materialize, as the news media sometimes has problems with their schedules. But an interview with CNN, so anybody who might be researching this in the future would be aware of that and be able to access that. But uh, I really don't have anything else I wanted to add. Is there anything that, that I omitted that I ought to be uh, considering? I think you've covered everything beautifully, yeah. Roger. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll have another opportunity to do this in a, a few years, or perhaps uh, even on the uh, day of the dedication of the mural. Oh, that would be wonderful if you could get all of the five of us together. That would Indeed. be really nice. Well, we'll certainly try. The icing on the cake. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.